Light Touch Manifestations How to Shape the Energy Field to Attract What You Want, by Richard Dots, Chapter 1, The Hidden Power of Taking a Light Touch, For Most People, The Thought of Taking a Light Touch in Their Lives Seems Unimaginable. What does it really mean to take a light touch? Does it mean giving up and not trying so hard in life? Does it mean settling for less? Or does it mean asking for things and accepting that we may not have it all? These are some of the themes we will explore in this book. We have been taught all through our lives that going after what we want, with all our might, is virtuous. Just the other day, I was surprised by the response given by one of my college students. I had asked him about his philosophy in life and he replied that he was always looking for a bigger fight. While he of course meant this metaphorically in terms of always looking for better opportunities and bigger challenges in life, I could not help but wonder who or what might have inculcated this mindset in his young mind. Who instilled the idea in so many of us that life is about engaging in constant battles with unknown enemies, problems, and issues? Who even gave us the idea that life is a struggle, that we have to try hard to get what we want, because we may not always get what we ask for? That in itself is another pervasive belief. Implicit in his innocent response lay the hidden belief that life is one long fight, or a series of problems and challenges after another. Sadly, that is also the reality which many people experience on a daily basis as a result of holding this fundamentally faulty belief. Life always gives back to you what you strongly believe in. If you believe, at a very deep level, that life is a struggle, a pain, and made up of one set of challenges after another, then that is what you are going to experience in your everyday, outer reality. It does not matter that you relish a challenge or hold some very positive attitudes about facing the various challenges in your life. Life, the universe, is just going to throw up more obstacles and problems in your way. I am often sent inspirational stories of various individuals who have triumphed against the challenges in their lives and emerged victorious against all odds. If you look closely at the lives of many of these individuals, you'll find that their days are filled with one obstacle after another, whether in the form of health, relationship challenges, business failures or some other catastrophic event. Of course, they might have emerged victorious against these stumbling blocks in their lives and even tackled them head-on with great determination. Their spirit is commendable, but there is still a big question left unanswered why do these challenges keep occurring, or recurring, in their lives? Why is it that when one crisis is solved or averted, the next one looms just round the corner? Could something be faulty in their own belief system? I have often taught, just as I discovered for myself, that any time there is a recurring pattern of positive or negative events in one's life, it is likely caused by a strong, underlying belief. Most of the time, these beliefs are unconscious and not obvious to the person who holds them. One of the most pervasive beliefs in our culture is that life is a struggle. An individual who believes so will be faced with one major challenge after another in life because that is what he expects and focuses upon. Another related belief is that there is some higher being, for example, God, who is testing us by deliberately giving us all these trials and tribulations. Therefore, we must endure these hardships in order to prove our worth to God. This is perhaps one of the most disempowering and self-defeating beliefs that is common to believers of organized religions. One has to realize why it is in the interest of religious leaders to perpetuate this belief. They themselves do not know better. 
What else can you say to the throngs of followers who are facing hardship and problems in their lives and knocking at your door? What better way to explain their pain and suffering by telling them that it is a trial from a higher being, and that it is only through these tests that they will be worthy of greater things in life? Anyone who has studied and examined these spiritual principles for themselves will know that this is absolutely untrue. You do not have to take my word for it. Neither do you have to take the word of the leaders of organized religions. You can prove all of this to yourself and know the truth at a very deep and intimate level through your own spiritual practice. No intermediary or medium is necessary. In other words, you can know God, and know the nature of divinity through your own beingness alone. When you are aware of the nature of your own being through continued focus on your inner states, you'll quickly realize and understand that God is omnipotent and that God is everything. There is no place or nothing that God is not. As such, it follows that God knows everything and has no need to set things up in order to test anyone. Why would God do so? You'll also realize that you are inseparable from God, in fact you are God. You are universal, divine source energy projected through a physical consciousness. So why would God, or this universal divine force, need to set out to deliberately test itself? There is nothing it is not, nothing it does not know, and nothing it needs to know. Once you see the true nature of your being, many of these untrue beliefs perpetuated through superstition or propaganda immediately fall apart on their own accord. But prove everything to yourself. Another common belief is that we need to face the challenges and problems in our life positively. That is certainly a good belief to have, until you stop and ponder why you have all these challenges to deal with in the first place. Is it because you believe that life is about solving one problem after another? Is it because you have come to expect human life as one filled with problems, hardship, and challenges? If so, facing your challenges positively only compounds the issue. You are setting yourself up in an endless loop for some really tough challenges in life so that they can then be handled positively by you. Do you see the conundrum that most people unknowingly get themselves into? By simultaneously believing that life is a struggle, belief number one, and that it is a virtue to meet challenges head on, belief number two, they have unknowingly set up a life of struggle and strive for themselves. Perhaps it is time to intend an alternative reality, in which your life is one of ease and flow and drop the notion of challenges or problems from your mind once and for all. You'll be surprised at what happens once you adopt this new intention in life. For the first half of my life, I believed wholeheartedly that life was a struggle and that it was a series of problems and challenges after another. I had come to believe that everything, ranging from my finances to relationships, was difficult. I adopted this belief unconsciously from my parents and from those around me, who constantly complained that life was tough and that it is natural to have problems in life. There are also various inspirational stories making their rounds about how the only people who do not have problems in life are those who are dead. While these stories certainly serve to motivate and inspire us in tough times, they also unintentionally keep us trapped. These stories perpetuate the mistaken belief that problems are to be expected in life, so we must face them with gusto whenever they crop up. My suggestion for you is to gently drop the notion of problem or challenge from your consciousness entirely. I will show you an easy way to do so in the second half of this book. You'll be surprised at what happens when you do so. I spent the first half of my life worrying myself to depression and to the verge of suicide because I saw no feasible way out of my problems and suffering. 
life just seemed to be one challenge after another. There was very little joy in my life, and whatever joy I found was conditional and short-lived. However, once I understood these spiritual teachings and applied them in my own life, everything turned around within a very short period of time. Even I am amazed at my own progress as I look back. What happened here? Did all the problematic people and events in my life simply fade away overnight? No, they still remained, physically, in my reality for a while more, but my inner state has changed drastically. I am no longer the same person on the inside. As I continued to maintain my newfound inner state of love and peace, they became vibrationally slash energetically incompatible with my new inner state and hence had to leave my life in one way or another, without my active intervention. This does not mean that they all passed on physically, thankfully, it just simply means that we have become so vibrationally incompatible with each other that our paths no longer crossed. We no longer attracted each other into our own experience. The universe has infinite ways to satisfy, delight and fulfill the destinies of each and every one of us. This means that I can continue living in a way that is in accordance with my highest intentions, and so can they. As I focused more on changing myself and working on my own inner state, outer reality had to match up to my new level of consciousness. This is universal law. We are going to adopt a three-step approach in this book. The first step is to deal with the current problems and challenges in your life with a light touch. This is probably the last time we will mention the concept of challenges or problems because what we are going to do is to drop them completely from our consciousness. We are erasing this concept of problems from our mental awareness. It is also the last time we will use the analogy of solving or dealing with them. But for the ease of exposition and explanation, let's stick to the old vernacular for the time being. Once you have erased all the perceived problems and challenges in your own life, it is time to move on to the second stage. The second stage is one in which you consciously decide what you want to create as a conscious creator but it is important to return your consciousness to a blank slate first. It is difficult to maintain your focus and purposefully create if your consciousness is filled with worries and problems, which is why it is crucial that we drop them in the first stage. The third step is where you give everything up to the higher power within you. In fact, this is when you realize that you are this higher power which you have been seeking your whole life. The infinite being which you are seeking, is you. The good that you are seeking is you. This is what spiritual teachers mean when they say, the good you are seeking is seeking you. This is the final stage which I hope you will be at by the time you finish reading this book. Of course, everyone starts at a different place and so will perceive this material slightly differently. Each reader will have their own takeaways, but I am convinced that you will at least gain some new understanding from this work if you follow the general path I have sketched. What I have attempted to do in this book is not to fit everything into a rigid, step-by-step -step system. I have never taken well to a step-by-step -step approach for spiritual growth or manifestations. Rather, I recognize that each of us start from a different place and may have different preferences and styles for discovering our inner worlds. As such, I have laid out a roadmap with broader principles. You are welcome to invent your own rules or to make things up as you go along, based on your own understanding and application of these broader principles. My explanations in this book are meant to clarify and guide, and certainly not meant to restrict. They are all intended to set you on a path of pondering and higher self-realization. This is an experiential book.
As with all of my recent works, I have moved from merely explaining concepts on paper to inviting readers to experience what I'm sharing for themselves. This is another way of saying that you don't have to take me at the level of my words. You are always welcome to experience exactly what I am writing and describing through these words. When you do so, you reach an even greater level of understanding. When your own personal experience matches up to what you have read, you will now be able to confidently say, now I know exactly what you are talking about. So this is how it feels. This form of learning will stay with you. You will be positively transformed as a result of this experience in more ways than one. Therefore, I encourage you to have fun with all of this as you read. Don't just read and memorize my words. Instead, read and apply my words. Act them out and live them on a physical level. Only then will you realize their true power for yourself. Life is meant to be easy. When you take a light touch and stop pushing so hard against the perceived issues and challenges in your life, they stop pushing back at you as well. A newfound sense of ease, flow, and natural momentum soon emerges. I am so excited and thrilled to be sharing this new way of living with you in the pages that follow. Let's get started. Chapter 2, Understanding Your Internal Filing System As one deepens his spiritual practice, he starts to realize a simple and fundamental truth. This truth would have been unimaginable or even unfathomable to him before, for his old way of operating in the world would not have allowed for it. Yet as an individual deepens his connection with Source, Spirit slash Divinity, he begins to realize that all the problems in his world are man-made. Put differently, problems are an artificial, man-made construct held in place by our beliefs. Realizing this is the first step to ultimate freedom. A construct is a theoretical concept which we have created in our minds through our perception or understanding of a situation. Different people can look at the same situation, the same set of facts, and come up with completely different conclusions about the matter. As a result, they may hold differing viewpoints and opinions about the very same facts, and be utterly convinced that their viewpoints are valid. What our mind does when it perceives any situation is to distort and organize the information in a way that fits our existing beliefs and worldviews. It does so automatically by default, so much so that we often do not realize the underlying filing process that has taken place. Whenever we attempt to file or categorize something into broad categories for ease of retrieval, we invariably lose a certain level of detail while gaining an artificial structure that holds everything together. This structure is one that has special meaning for us so we can always fall back on it when needed. Suppose that I have set up a filing system in my office organized by the type of documents received. I may then have a file for my bills, another file for my contracts, another file for my unfinished manuscripts and so on. When a bill for my mobile phone subscription comes in, it immediately goes into the file for all my bills. I do the same for my credit card and utilities bill for the month. When I need to refer to my credit card bill from last December, I instinctively know where to look as a result of my filing system. Having a filing system speeds things up and allows me to make sense of all the information that is thrown at me in a meaningful way. If I had chosen to set up my filing system based on the corporation I'm dealing with, I would have one file for my mobile carrier, one file for the credit card company, one file for the utilities company and so on. My mobile phone and credit card bills would now end up in different files as a result of my new way of classification. 
Note that the way of classification is completely arbitrary and up to me. I can choose to set up my filing system in whatever way I choose, so long as I stick to the same set of filing rules once they have been decided upon. This way of classification is similar to what happens in our own belief system. In fact, the belief system that operates at the level of our mind is similar to a physical filing system. We have set up various rules in advance to deal with, interpret, each new piece of information that comes up. Unlike our physical filing systems which may have been thoughtfully designed, this internal belief system was built up with a large number of haphazard, often illogical rules over a period of time. Some of these rules may have been put in place when we were small children or by various authority figures in our lives. We often do not closely examine the decision rules which we use to respond to various life situations, and this can lead to unnecessary pain and suffering. For example, if you have always believed that people are generally unkind and rude to others, your belief, then each encounter with a brusque individual will be interpreted in a way consistent with that belief. This results in a belief that is slowly but surely strengthened over time. Each new encounter becomes a confirmation that people in this world are indeed selfish and uncaring. Now suppose that your underlying belief is that people are kind and generous. What happens when you have an unpleasant encounter with someone? Instead of perceiving that individual as inherently rude and unkind, you may instead attribute his behavior to a bad day at work, or to some valid reason which caused him to be upset. Do you see what just happened here? The exact same set of circumstances on the outside, but completely different interpretations on the inside. Our mind does this filing process every single moment of every day, interpreting and distorting what it observes to fit our innermost beliefs without us realizing it. If you understand my analogy above, it becomes easy to see why all problems are actually man-made constructs. All problems in our world can be traced to an originating, faulty belief. Once that belief is changed or dropped, then the outer situation has to be restored. The first individual in our earlier example has a problem. His problem is that people in this world are rude, selfish, and uncaring, and he therefore needs to take extra steps to safeguard against them. Someone who operates with this negative belief will then engage in lots of defensive and political actions at the workplace, quite possibly leading the individual into even more unhappy situations with his co-workers. Each additional unhappy situation further reinforces his original belief and may even lead to the formation of additional unresourceful beliefs. He has thus, by virtue of his own beliefs, attracted more and more of the unwanted. This is the fundamental law of attraction at work. The second individual who perceives people in this world as kind, generous and caring does not have these issues. Because he perceives everyone as kind and always willing to help, he responds in a similar fashion in the world. He thus attracts himself to more and more happy situations that match his deeply held beliefs. Even when he encounters a situation to the contrary, his belief system classifies it as an anomaly and he dismisses it as contrary to his own beliefs. This is why both positive and negative beliefs can be pervasive and difficult to change once they are formed. Each new input from the external world, each new document we receive, either confirms or invalidates our previous beliefs. However, it is the job of your belief system to assimilate these new pieces of information into your current beliefs as much as possible. As such, our minds often distort and generalize the information without us realizing it. Put differently, we do not have an objective view of our own reality. Instead, 
we interpret reality in a manner that is consistent with our existing beliefs without realizing we are doing so. Just as in a physical filing system, a bill from the mobile phone carrier generalizes into a bill so that it can fit into the right file. Similarly, an unpleasant encounter with a rude service staff generalizes into people are rude so that the new encounter can fit under an existing belief. Notice how we lose the full details of the situation each time we classify or file it according to our beliefs. This is our brain's way of making sense of the information and world around us. Once you have understood how our internal filing system works, we can see the source of problems slash issues slash challenges in our lives. When your office is in a disorganized mess, are the documents themselves the problem, or is there a problem with your filing system, and with how you handle the various documents? Do you blame the various parties that send you letters and correspondences in the mail, or do you attribute the problem to an inefficient filing system that needs to be improved? When there is a disorganized mess on our desk, we know better than to blame the documents and pieces of paper themselves. We do not demand that the companies stop sending us those letters. Instead, what we do is to fix the root cause of the issue our filing system. We examine which aspect of the filing system has resulted in this mess and rectify the oversight accordingly. Suppose we find our desk always piled high with a certain document. This makes us realize that we have no file set up to handle this particular type of correspondence. The solution is to set up a new ring file in which all these documents can be filed, instead of having them pile up on our desk in future. What we have done here is to incorporate a new filing rule to deal with the mess. Focusing on the individual pieces of paper, events in our lives, themselves will be doing it the hard way, because we would not have dealt with the issue completely. This means that the next time we receive the same document, the same issue of where to file it or how to handle it crops up again. The issue is a faulty filing, belief, system, not the events in our external reality. In fact, a recurring event gives us a strong indication that something needs to be corrected in our belief system. I love this filing analogy because it provides an accurate representation of how our emotional systems work. Our emotional, mental filing, systems become overloaded when we do not have an effective belief slash filing system to deal with life. An individual with a weak, overridingly negative belief system is unable to cope with the various inputs from the outside world in a resourceful and empowering way. What often results is that this individual falls into a state of depression, a state in which the mind cannot cope with external stimuli and seeks to limit the amount of input received as much as possible. This is akin to trying to reduce the number of documents we receive on a daily basis in order to deal with the mess on our desks, which is a backward and unrealistic solution to the issue. The real issue that needs to be addressed is the faulty belief system in itself. To an untrained mind, there is nothing more it can do other than to deliberately try and reduce the amount of external stimuli received. Depressed individuals often have very poor appetite and coop themselves up at home all the time. I should know, because I was once depressed for a few years. During this period of time, all I could do from morning to night was to stare at the wall and cry. When I was not crying, I was asleep. What my mind was trying to do at that time was to minimize the external stimuli from external events and from interacting with others. Crying was a way for the body to release the emotional overload. Depression is a sad state of affairs which I certainly do not wish upon anyone. But understand that even if you are there, it is not the end of the world. 
The events which I perceived so strongly to be the unsolvable problems in my life at that time were not the actual problems at all. In fact, the actual issue was within myself. The answer was within me all along. Over time, I had allowed myself to build and rely upon a faulty, unresourceful belief system that was causing me great misery and suffering. This misery and suffering in turn led to an overloading of my internal emotional system, to a point where I had so much negative energy within myself that I could not deal with it effectively anymore. All I needed to do back then was to ease off a little, to realize that everything originated from my faulty beliefs and not from the tangible events in my outer world. When you realize that your beliefs are arbitrary and can be changed at any time, just like how the rules of a filing system can easily be changed, you are free. Chapter 3, Unboxing the Black Box of Manifestations, Why is it important to outline and clearly describe the inner workings of our belief system? One thing I realized when reading self-help and spiritual books early on in my journey was that they always talked about the power of our beliefs and the subconscious mind. Despite delving into great detail on how negative beliefs could sabotage our manifestations, not a single book ever explained in a step-by-step -step manner how our belief system works and how it relates to our physical manifestations. Instead, these books all viewed our internal belief system as a black box and skipped straight to explaining the consequences of having negative beliefs. As a result, readers are often left in a lurch and end up forming mistaken concepts about our belief system. Without understanding this black box, we can make very little progress towards changing our unhelpful beliefs. What I have attempted to do in the last chapter was to demystify our belief system and explain it in a way that is relatable to most of us. Once you understand how your own belief system works, you'll be able to see exactly how your beliefs have been holding up your manifestations. As most contemporary books tend to take a black box approach and skip any detailed explanations of it, readers are often left confused and bewildered when told to change their negative beliefs into positive ones. How does one begin doing so? To address this issue, let us first take a look at a few common misconceptions about the belief system. Because so few teachers have ever explained how the belief system works, students have gone on to form their own uninformed views. The most common misconception is that our belief system is a powerful, magical thing that somehow makes things happen in our lives. Therefore, some individuals believe, due to a lack of understanding, that once they instill a particular belief in their life that they can have something, that what they ask for magically pops up into their external reality. Yet that is not the way it works. Consider this does setting up a new file in your filing system titled Business Orders automatically bring you more business? Does the file automatically fill itself up? Absolutely not. The file will not fill itself up unless you also make some changes in the way you operate to solicit those new business. So no, just instilling a new belief in yourself will not automatically fill up your reality with more stuff. The second misconception is that our belief system is this powerful entity that runs our life. This is a scary thought because it suggests that we are under the whims and fancies of our belief system, and that we are somehow powerless to change it. This is again untrue. Think about the filing system you have in your office. It is a powerful system because it helps you make sense and organize all your incoming information in a meaningful way. It may also help you make some pretty good business and life decisions. But does it make those decisions for you? Does it exert any physical control over you, to the extent of making you act in a particular way when you do not want to? 
Absolutely not. Your filing system is powerful because it organizes information and gives meaning to them, but nothing beyond that. Even the rules which you ascribe to your filing system are arbitrary and can be changed. The rules by themselves have no power over you. It is how you have allowed yourself to abide by those rules over time that has resulted in powerful, outer changes. So I often find it amusing that some teachers ascribe great power to the belief system as if it is an overriding force in our life that absolutely cannot be changed. That cannot be further from the truth. We can choose to change our belief system at any time, and a belief is not something that physically has influence over you. It is simply a thought that you think over and over again. It helps to think of your belief system in the proper framework because that will give you the much needed freedom and leeway to recognize your power as a true creator. Instead of seeing your belief system as an adversary in the manifestation process, see it as a friend that automates and simplifies things. Once you recognize the role your belief system plays in your manifestations, you'll understand why most people keep getting the results they have been getting in their lives. Now that we have discussed what the belief system is not, let us talk about what it is. Here is what our belief system is it is simply a set of rules which we have allowed ourselves to follow over time. These rules determine how we will respond to situations, how we will react to situations and what crops up in our consciousness most of the time. It is very important to realize that these rules slash beliefs are arbitrary and can be changed at any time. This point is worth repeating, your beliefs are arbitrary and can be changed at any time, should you decide to. One is never captive to their beliefs, unless a part of them chooses to do so. Also, it is not important why you came to have that belief in the first place. I have never found a value in looking for the source of our beliefs. Beliefs can sometimes be formed spontaneously and with very little conscious intervention, such as during a traumatic event or when we were young and under the influence of authority figures in our lives. Therefore, there is very little value in looking for the source or origin of our beliefs. What matters is that we can change our beliefs in an instant if we wanted to. All through our lives, we have been unconsciously accepting input into our belief system. This input comes in the form of events, people, and circumstances. The perfect example of this can be seen in the life of a young child. A young child comes into this world and starts receiving input the moment he slash she is born. In fact, he receives this input every moment of the day with very little control and influence over what he receives. At this stage of his life, his parents, the authority figures in his life, supply most of his beliefs and he accepts them without question. This is why a large portion of our beliefs about our worthiness, deservingness, and how to deal with others in this world are unconsciously formed before the age of six. The child is powerless to prevent the downloading or installation of these beliefs in his belief system. He simply accepts them as it is. The issue is compounded when the child grows up in a family where the parent has a substance addiction or relationship issues. In this case, the child tends to grow up with a skewed worldview which may then manifest itself as problems and issues later on in own life. Even without training in any of this material, most adults are able to identify certain aspects of their personality that match that of their parents. Why do you think this is so? That's right, we downloaded and accepted their beliefs for ourselves when we were young. Since they were the authority figures in our life, we mimicked their way of living and operating in this world, whether their ways were beneficial, resourceful, or otherwise. 
Knowing this is the first step to personal freedom. When we were young, we did not have the ability to accept or reject any of these personal beliefs. We did not have the discerning ability to decide what was good for us. As adults however, we have the ability to reject much of the input which we receive around us. For example, when we see someone indulging in fast food, we may think oh that is an unhealthy habit, and thus prevent the formation of that belief slash habit in our belief system. A child does not have the same power to reject any of this external input. One belief that I unknowingly downloaded from my mother was that things could go wrong in life, and hence I needed to plan ahead for every single thing that could go wrong. These beliefs kept me always on the verge of breakdown and made me a worry wart for most of my adult life, until I realized the underlying beliefs and made it a point to drop them. The more you look at your own life, the more you will identify certain beliefs that give rise to recurring behavior. If you look closely enough, the beliefs will reveal themselves to you. Just becoming aware of these beliefs by themselves can be a very liberating experience. Once these beliefs are embedded in our belief system, we begin a process of confirming them. The confirmation process means that we will interpret external stimuli in a way that is consistent with our existing beliefs, thus solidifying them. As mentioned in the previous chapter, this is the ego's way of making us feel safe and secure. The confirmation process also causes us to seek out new experiences that match our long-held beliefs. Thus an individual may find himself in recurring situations over and over again, just to prove to himself that his beliefs are valid. The other component of our belief system is that we also engage in an attraction process. This is where the fundamental law of attraction comes into play. Every thought and feeling that we hold carries with it an emotional, energetic charge. That is why we literally feel something in our bodies as we think a thought or have a feeling. We are feeling this energy running through our bodies. Fortunately or unfortunately, this energy does not just do nothing. Although this energy is initially non-physical in nature, it actually affects the universal energetic field around us in tangible ways. What this means is that each thought we think and each feeling we feel carries with it an equivalent energetic charge. The more intense the feeling, the more powerful and intense the energetic charge. This energetic charge goes on to attract thoughts and feelings of a similar nature, which eventually culminate in physical manifestations. In other words, a single unit of energy attracts more and more units of energy of similar frequency and nature, until it attracts so much energy that it becomes a physically observable blob of energy, which is a physical object. You can observe this readily in your own life. If you have allowed yourself to think angry thoughts or stew over a negative issue in your life, you would have become angrier and angrier. This is the first stage in which your thoughts attracted more angry thoughts and feelings. If you held on to those feelings for long enough, they would then result in some form of an unpleasant physical manifestation or confrontation down the road. This is the second stage in which the energy surrounding an issue is big enough to result in a physical manifestation. This is manifestations explained in a nutshell. You can also reverse the example above and substitute angry for happy. If you allow yourself to think happy thoughts all day long, you would attract more and more happy thoughts to your consciousness. You would have more things to be happy about and life would be so perfect for you. Eventually, you would have attracted so much happy energy that a happy physical manifestation becomes inevitable. This is how the law of attraction works at the most basic level. And so, 
your belief system engages in the job of attraction and confirmation all day long. You attract more of what is consistent with your innermost beliefs. Once you understand this mechanism, you're now well on your way to creating whatever you want in your outer reality within a very short time. Let us talk about a third function of the belief system besides attraction and confirmation. Our belief system feeds us with reference material. Think of your filing system as a library. You have different documents filed in it which you can refer to at will. When you're bored, you can just go over to one of the files, pick it up and read the contents inside. This is a key point what you read will depend on what is filed in your filing system. While it may seem obvious, this is actually a crucial point when it comes to our belief system. What you have accumulated in your belief system as a result of the attraction and confirmation process determines your default consciousness, and what you think about most of the time. For example, if I have the belief that I need to plan for things that can go wrong in life, all of the documents in my belief system will be of a similar nature. I would have attracted and filed a long list of things that have gone wrong in my life and in other people's lives. Therefore, when I need any evidence to back up my belief, my belief system readily delivers that information to me. Right now, I am writing this in my library filled with beautiful metaphysical and spiritual books. As a result, my consciousness is filled with the teachings from all these books. I can go up to any bookshelf and pull out any book at random, and it will either be a spiritual or self-help book. Why can't I pull out a book about gardening? It's simple, books about gardening don't even exist in this library of mine that I have built. The same applies to your belief system. If you have filled your belief system with thoughts and beliefs of lack and limitation, then every belief you pull out will be one centered on lack and limitation. You will not be able to pull out anything on prosperity, and thus you will never be able to attract anything that is counter to your currently held beliefs. This is another key point. The interesting thing about our belief system is that it throws things up into our consciousness based on what we have previously filed inside. These thoughts arise spontaneously inside our mind. Think of it as a faithful librarian who brings you a random book to read every once in a while, except that this librarian of our mind does so every single moment, with every single thought that passes through our consciousness. Where do you think it gets these thoughts from? It gets them from what you have accumulated and filed in your belief system throughout your entire life. And you had better make sure what you filed is what you want to read, because it can never deliver anything to the contrary, or give you anything that is not there. Does it make sense now? If you have filled your belief system with beliefs and confirmatory evidence about lack and limitation in your life, then that is all your belief system, unconscious mind, can bring up to your conscious mind every single day. It cannot bring up anything else that is not there. This is why the inner work seems so difficult in the beginning. We are trying to work against the tide of all our negative thoughts we have accumulated in the past. It is easy to see the nature of all the unconscious beliefs you have filed in your life. Just quiet your mind for a moment and see what thoughts spontaneously arise without attempting to change them. Do the thoughts that spontaneously arise make you feel good or bad? Are they positive or negative thoughts? Are they thoughts of worry or thoughts of joy? These thoughts are not emerging in your consciousness by accident or random chance. Rather, your unconscious mind is throwing these thoughts up to your consciousness as a result of your past conditioning, in an attempt to make you feel safe. 
It is rehashing what you have always known to make you feel secure. If you do the exercise above and find that your consciousness is spontaneously filled with positive thoughts, then I am certain that most things in your physical reality are pleasing to you. You will be leading a good and comfortable life, and manifestations appear quickly for you in your physical reality. However, if negative thoughts crowd your consciousness, then I am also certain that your outer reality reflects the same. How can I be so sure? This is universal law and is the ultimate proof of what I am talking about. Prove it to yourself. Fortunately though, all of that can be changed. If the thoughts in your inner world do not bring you peace and joy at the moment, understand that it is the underlying beliefs that are causing them. Once you learn how to disconnect the emotional charge of your underlying beliefs, things will resolve themselves accordingly on the outside. Chapter 4, How Physical Manifestations Really Happen, Why Do Individuals Who Learn About These Spiritual Techniques For The First Time Find It So Difficult To Manifest Their Desires? The answer is simple. They are working against the cumulative effect of all their existing beliefs that have accumulated over the past few decades. If we could see the amount of junk we are hauling around with us all the time, we would be absolutely surprised by the enormity of it all. No wonder some people feel tired and drained all the time. Our negative thoughts not only sap our energy and compete for our attention, they may also lead to unwanted physical ailments down the road if the issue is left unchecked. Fortunately, there is an easy way to reverse all this once you understand these universal principles. Your mind serves as a perfect filing mechanism, dutifully recording every single piece of information and every new input received during your waking moments. All these pieces of information are grouped and categorized according to your beliefs. Therefore, your beliefs provide you with a framework through which you organize your thoughts and make sense of the world. Without our beliefs to hold everything together, we would not be able to easily assimilate new pieces of information or make sense of the world around us. Unfortunately, a consequence of this mechanism is that it also keeps us trapped. When the mind is left by itself, thoughts will spontaneously arise in our consciousness without our active intervention. Notice how you don't even have to try and think a thought. Somehow, random thoughts will just float into your consciousness, calling out for your attention. Some of these thoughts may be related to recent or current events. Others may be from events that have long passed. It is important to understand that these thoughts do not come from nowhere. Instead, they originate from that unconscious slash subconscious part of your mind where all your unconscious beliefs are held. This is also the place where all your memories have accumulated over time and are organized according to the structure put in place by your beliefs. There would ordinarily be no problem with these distracting thoughts appearing in our consciousness. Some of us call it mind chatter or that inner voice within. However, the main problem is that over time, we have come to believe in these thoughts and identify strongly with them. This means that we have come to associate with those thoughts and see them as a part of our true being. This is the initial pitfall made by everyone believing in our own mind chatter. I still remember my experiences with learning meditation. During the first few years when I tried to meditate, my mind chatter would go on and on, feeding me with one thought and imagery after another which I would chase like a fox down a rabbit hole. I thought I was meditating whenever I closed my eyes, but all I was doing was following and getting distracted by the mind chatter which entertained me with some very interesting and vivid imagery. It was as if I was watching a movie in my mind whenever I meditated. 
This is also the reason why some individuals, especially beginning meditators, wrongly believe that they are communicating with spirit or receiving external visions when they meditate. They are not. It can be difficult for a beginner to distinguish between actual visions, from the divine, and imagined phenomenon produced by their overly active minds. In fact, I have found that when a beginner claims to see visions or receive pieces of information during their meditations, it is almost always due to their mind chatter and not due to any divine intervention. I will come back to this point in greater detail later. Another key point to note here is that there are some meditation teachers and traditions that encourage students to talk about and share their visions with the class. As a result, some students may go into great detail describing what they see during their meditation practice. It is important once again to not fall into this pitfall as what is typically seen during meditation by a beginning student is nothing more than the false projections of our unconscious mind. When our mind is given free reign to think in whatever direction it wants, it usually combines various elements and pieces of unrelated information from our unconscious to give us seemingly new pieces of information. This information is not from the divine. Instead, it is rehashed information that we are feeding to ourselves. The second mistake is to believe in all these visions seen during meditation. While there is nothing inherently bad about doing so, an individual can spend an inordinate amount of time chasing these delusional thoughts, and even believing in the power of these delusional thoughts over their lives. This path can lead one further and further away from the spiritual freedom that we seek. Even when we are not meditating and in our waking states, we have come to believe in our mind chatter. When our minds throw up an unwanted scenario of something bad happening, we usually feel worried in response to that thought. When our minds throw up the thought that I am not good enough, most individuals believe in it without question and allow themselves to get carried away by those negative feelings. The first step to becoming an effective creator and manifester of your own reality is to disassociate yourself from all these thoughts that appear in your consciousness. Stop believing in them and stop engaging in them. Simply observe them for what they are, as thoughts arising from your unconscious storehouse of memories and gently let them go. This may be difficult to do in the beginning, but the value will be immense the more you engage in this practice. Some people spend their whole lives believing in their own false thoughts. Do you now see why it can be difficult for an individual to change his physical reality? The cycle goes like this, our embedded beliefs in our unconscious causes us to attract more people, things, and events that match those beliefs. When these events happen, we interpret them in a way that is consistent with our beliefs, which confirms and deepens them even further. This leads to an enormous unconscious storehouse of thoughts and beliefs which occupy our consciousness during our waking hours. When we accept everything which our unconscious throws up for us and believe in our mind chatter, we go on to perpetuate existing reality even further. This cycle repeats itself all through our lives until we finally become aware of it. The slow way to work through all this would be to attempt to find every single negative belief we have, and then begin the process of changing it into something positive. This is the method which has been advocated by some. The downside of this method is that we have so many beliefs to deal with that going through all of them manually and changing each of them takes a long time. Besides, many of our beliefs are unconscious and not immediately apparent to us. We do not even know that we have them. How then do we deal with our unconscious beliefs in the first place? Another way to work through all this would be to flood our mind with positive beliefs, and do so consistently enough such that we eventually have more positive than negative beliefs in our consciousness. 
This is also the reason why affirmations and other repetition techniques can be useful. But as I have outlined in my other books, the forceful application of these techniques can often compound the problem and perpetuate it even more, simply because we are focusing so much on the problem or lack in the first place. I tried the first and second methods with very little success during the first 10 years of my spiritual journey. Readers of my other books will know that I tried one, manifestation technique after another with no results. I also attempted to flood my subconscious with positive beliefs by writing out carefully worded affirmations by hand hundreds of times daily. All of that led to little results for me, mainly because I did not know what I was dealing with. Back then, I still did not have a complete understanding of our belief system as I do today. Even if we managed to flood our subconscious with positive beliefs, our attempts would still be puny compared to the mass of negative programming and beliefs that we have unknowingly accumulated over our lifetimes. The answer that I eventually found, thanks to several spiritual masters and teachers along the way, is the stop trying to deal with your individual beliefs. Stop trying to undo the social conditioning that you have received. You are doing things the hard way because what you are trying to do is to clear out a storehouse that contains decades of accumulated memories and beliefs. Instead, there is only one thing that needs to be done. All you need to do is to break the link between your thoughts and your feelings, and everything will be restored to normal. Unconscious memories organized according to our deeply held beliefs give rise to our mind chatter, which is thoughts that appear in our unconscious. This is the first link, unconscious memories slash beliefs equals equals conscious thoughts, mind chatter, these conscious thoughts give rise to our feelings and emotions, our emotional response, when we think them. For example, if a thought arises in your consciousness that I am not good enough, you immediately feel saddened and discouraged. This leads to unwanted negative feelings of sadness and discouragement. This is the second link, unconscious memories slash beliefs equals equals conscious thoughts equals equals feelings and emotions in our inner state unconscious belief, unworthiness equals equals conscious thought, I am not good enough equals equals feeling slash emotion, sadness, discouragement, negativity about life the above sequence repeats itself every single waking moment of our life. As a result, we are literally held hostage by the nature of our thoughts. We are at the mercy of whatever floats into our conscious awareness. If our conscious thoughts are of a negative nature and we believe in them long enough, we end up in a state of depression, which is a state of overwhelming sadness and negative emotions. I have also mentioned that all our feelings and emotions are energy. Therefore, they don't just do nothing. These feelings and emotions when held for long enough with sufficient intensity actually lead to outer, physical manifestations. This leads to the third link. Unconscious memories slash beliefs equals equals conscious thoughts equals equals feelings and emotions in our inner state equals equals physical manifestations these physical manifestations which happen in our external world confirm our existing beliefs, and hence the whole cycle repeats itself again. Most methods attempt to deal with unwanted physical manifestations by trying to eradicate the unconscious memories and beliefs, the first component in the chain. We can see why this would work, because once the belief is dealt with, then there would be no conscious thoughts and feelings related to that belief, and hence no physical attraction. However, I have found this manual approach to be time-consuming in most cases, although there can sometimes be value in dealing with one or two major beliefs we have identified in our lives that are preventing us from moving forward. The second component in the chain, conscious thoughts, 
is literally impossible to deal with. There are millions of thoughts passing through our conscious awareness every day that it would be impossible to artificially control and change them one by one. This is why attempts at positive thinking seldom work. We are attempting to do the impossible, which is to control the nature of our millions of thoughts. The third component in the chain, feelings and emotions, are a response to our spontaneous conscious thoughts. Again, we can attempt to feel happy or force ourselves to feel happy, but our efforts will be short-lived if we still allow ourselves to believe in all our conscious thoughts. An easy way around all this is to simply break the second link, the link between our conscious thoughts and the feelings slash emotions we feel as a result of those thoughts. I am grateful for teachers like Lester Levinson for their pioneering work in this area because of its immense effectiveness. When you break the link between your conscious thoughts and your feelings, you are no longer at the mercy of your unconscious beliefs. The beliefs can still be there. The thoughts can still be there. But because you are now no longer affected by your thoughts and no longer believe in them, the buck stops there. These beliefs and thoughts no longer go on to affect your outer manifestations. This is the first time I'm explaining the whole chain of events in this manner although I have often talked about the importance of letting go of one's negative feelings in my previous books. When one lets go of all his negative feelings and emotions, he is essentially breaking the chain between his thoughts and how he feels. When he does so, he stops creating an undesired reality. But more importantly, he disconnects and frees himself from the influence of all his previous negative beliefs and memories. He becomes free from all his past conditioning. This is why this method is so effective and once mastered, will allow you to create your desired reality within a very short period of time. Let's look at how to apply it next. Chapter 5, Breaking the Chain of Unconscious Manifestations Let's recap the manifestation sequence we covered in the previous chapter. I like to call this the chain that binds us, although once an individual understands how this chain can be so easily broken, it is like holding the keys to manifesting anything you want in the palm of your hand. How wonderful is that? By understanding the manifestation sequence and how it works, we can move towards any reality we desire and live life as the powerful creators we were meant to be. 1. Unconscious memories slash beliefs equals equals, 2. Conscious thoughts equals equals, 3. Feelings and emotions in our inner state equals equals, 4. Physical manifestations in our outer world the link between components, 3. And, 4 of the chain is dictated by the universal law of attraction. This is the nature of our universe and we cannot change it even if we tried. However, the link between 2 and 3 can be easily broken. Our conscious thoughts do not always have to lead to spontaneous feelings and emotions in our inner state that we have no control over. The beautiful thing about being a creator is that we can always choose the way we want to feel and have full autonomy over our thoughts. Therefore, breaking the link between 2 and 3 is actually easier than we think. It all starts with having a greater awareness over what takes place on the inside. Most beginning students of this material have lived their whole lives with an outer directed focus. They are constantly preoccupied with what happens in their outer world that they very seldom turn inwards to look at what is inside. This is why individuals can be gripped by an irrational sense of fear when they try a spiritual practice such as meditation for the very first time. Meditation requires that we adopt an inward focus and take a look at what is happening in our inner world. It requires that we withdraw our attention, 
at least momentarily, from outer reality. In a similar vein, manifestation is an inner exercise. I have often taught that our inner states dictate the effectiveness of our outer manifestations and you will observe this to be true once you start putting these techniques into practice. Most people who have been living unconsciously all their lives have no idea how tumultuous their inner states are. Their inner states, the thoughts which they are think automatically and by default most of the time, are making them feel uncomfortable without them even knowing it. Therefore, the very first step to reversing this negative cycle is to gently turn inwards and notice what is happening on the inside. You can do this by closing your eyes and sitting quietly by yourself in a comfortable spot where you will not be interrupted. At first, all will seem to be black and dark. But notice the thoughts that float past your consciousness. Notice the thoughts that arise spontaneously. Without labeling or judging your thoughts, just notice how they make you feel. Do these spontaneous thoughts make you feel good? Do they make you feel light and happy, or do they make you feel negative and worried? The way you feel spontaneously is the dominant vibration of your inner state. This dominant vibration then goes on to attract and create your outer reality. One insight you'll gain from this exercise is that the dominant vibration which you hold on the inside will closely approximate your outer reality. If you feel that your inner vibration, feeling state, has a slightly negative overtone to it, then your outer reality will also have parts and portions which you consider to be slightly negative. Similarly, if you feel a sense of spontaneous joy and happiness when you do this exercise, then I am certain that your outer reality is one of happy manifestations, fulfillment, and joy. Your outer reality always matches your inner state. The purpose of this exercise is not to change anything. It is to make you notice and realize, quite possibly for the first time in your life, that you are the creator of your own reality. Until you stop to do this exercise, you would have lived life by default. You might have believed in luck or chance, and that things happen to you randomly influenced by factors beyond your control. However, an individual who does this exercise immediately realizes that he is the creator of his own reality. He can now clearly see the direct correlation between his dominant inner state and outer reality, which is the link between, 3, and, 4, we have outlined above. The link between our inner state and outer reality is not our work. It is the nature and work of our universe. Our work is to tend to our inner states and to ensure that we are immersed in feelings of peace, joy, and fulfillment most of the time. When we do this, the universe does its part by filling our external world with people and events of a similar nature. When our inner state is filled with angry or depressed thoughts, our outer reality reflects the same. Most people are at the mercy of their accumulated negative conditioning and thoughts. This causes their inner states to be filled with worry and fear thoughts without them realizing it. An individual who is in a state of depression will be constantly thinking negative worry thoughts. He thinks that these thoughts are beyond his control, and that they arise spontaneously in his consciousness when in fact, these thoughts are the result of cumulative past conditioning and beliefs. Therein lies the solution to break the chain, or to disconnect yourself from the thoughts that run through your consciousness all day. It is a simple method. So simple in fact that I'm afraid you will dismiss it at first glance. But it is a key part of this entire manifestation sequence I'm talking about, so stick with me for a moment. For the first few years of my spiritual journey, I had limited success with manifesting anything using the various manifestation techniques and methods that I tried. 
The reason for this was because my inner state was filled with lots of worry and fear thoughts. These thoughts arose spontaneously in my own consciousness and it seemed I had no control over them. While I did not know it then, these thoughts were caused by my own underlying beliefs and programming accumulated over a lifetime. When I try to apply the manifestation techniques taught, for example to feel as if my manifestations have already happened, this technique was met with limited success because my consciousness was overwhelmed by the negative thoughts that were present. In other words, I was trying to add my good feelings into a vibrational state that was overwhelmingly negative. Little wonder that things did not work since the universe always picks up on the sum total of our thoughts and feelings. The first step in the light touch manifestation sequence is to return your inner state back to one of peace and nothingness. When you return your inner state back to zero, a state in which you feel neither positive nor negative thoughts, this is the state where miracles happen. This is the zero state where your consciousness is clear, from which you can finally receive signals and inputs, inspiration, from the divine. Even if you did nothing at all and just remained in this zero state for the rest of your life, everything will still be done unto you. This is a counterintuitive aspect of these spiritual teachings that is difficult to grasp unless you personally experience it for yourself. And it is possible to experience the state for yourself with just a little focus and practice. This is what the great spiritual master Lao Tzu meant when he wrote, the great master that is the Tao does nothing and leaves nothing undone. One can just as easily substitute the Tao for the universe, spirit, or the divine. What Lao Tzu was trying to convey is that if one tends to his own inner state and remains in the state of nothingness and pure beingness, then one does not need to do anything. Effort is no longer necessary. One no longer needs to exert any effort and things will still occur spontaneously in his external reality. He will be swept along by the beautiful flow of the universe and become a wonderful observer in all of life. This does not mean that an individual becomes lifeless and not take any physical action at all. It simply means that if and when there is physical action to be taken, he will receive such a clear impulse and signal to take it that all paths will be opened for him to do so. Taking action will then seem like the most natural thing to do in the world, for it springs from universal impulse. The first step to achieving this state is to stop believing in the thoughts that arise spontaneously in your consciousness all day long. You do not have to force the thoughts to go away or replace them with positive ones. That would be doing it the hard way. Instead, all you have to do is to stop believing or mentally engaging in the thoughts that crop up for you. If you'll only take this first step in the manifestation sequence, you'll find your life drastically changing for the better. Maybe you have already taken this direction as a result of reading my other books, in which case you're well on your way. Whenever a fear thought crops up for you that causes you to feel corresponding emotions of fear, or whenever worrying thoughts crop up for you, you must have the initial focus and discipline to let them go at once without believing in them. Drop them gently. Understand that there is no truth or basis to those thoughts other than the meaning you have given them based on your beliefs. Here are a few examples of thoughts arising spontaneously in our consciousness so you can see how pervasive and persistent our ego is. Suppose you are interacting with a co-worker and you suddenly get the notion that she does not like me. That is a thought which arose spontaneously from your unconscious, possibly supported by one or more related beliefs in the area of interpersonal relationships and self-worth. If you choose to believe in that thought and engage in it, then the resulting train of thoughts can only get more and more negative, resulting in an extremely negative inner state caused by that single originating thought. For example, 
the initial thought of she does not like me may generalize to no one likes me, and other equally depressing thoughts such as no one has ever liked me, no one wants to be my friend, I have no friends, only people who take advantage of me, and so on. Understand that all these thoughts have no truth in them, apart from your own belief in them. When the initial negative thought arises, the first step is to let it go gently from your consciousness. Check within to see if there are any negative feelings resulting from that initial thought. You may feel a slight sense of discomfort or uneasiness. If so, let that feeling of discomfort or uneasiness go at once. It is easier to deal with a feeling in its initial stages than with a stronger feeling that has been added onto by the law of attraction. It is helpful to take a deep breath and feel that energy leaving your body. Do this as many times until you have feel the feeling leave your body, until your inner state is restored to one of peace and ease. In the beginning, it may be necessary to do this letting go process several times until the feelings are completely gone from your consciousness. Over time, you'll realize that feelings can be let go of in an instant, just like that. I recommend that you try this first step of restoring your inner state to zero over the next week or so. Forget about manifestations and everything you have learned up to this point. Instead, focus on getting your inner state centered on love and peace. Focus on dropping your negative feelings the moment you feel them, and gently let the intrusive thoughts go from your consciousness once you have them. Don't even blame yourself for them or try to find where these thoughts came from. Don't engage in them. Instead, gently let your intrusive thoughts go each time they arise. Do this every waking moment. Make it your priority. It will be difficult in the beginning, but the more you do it, the more you realize that you can easily be free from the thousands of thoughts that pass through your mind every hour, just like that. You are no longer subject to their negative influences, and they no longer carry any emotional charge over you. While you may still think the same thoughts, they no longer affect your inner emotional states. Over time, you'll find these thoughts cropping up less and less for you, until you eventually reach a point where they'll just stop presenting themselves to you. Chapter 6, Dealing with Major Recurring Life Themes, Restoring Your Inner State to One of Love, Peace and Nothingness is the Key to Effective Manifestations. It has also been the focus of my previous 16 books, in which I talk about various ways to tend to your inner state and return it to that state of zero from which we are once again free to create. I must remind the reader here that unless you take the initial effort necessary to return your inner state to one of peace and love, nothing that you read from this point will work effectively for you. I know this from my own experience. You cannot have these manifestation techniques work for you while simultaneously holding on to worry or fear thoughts. Your consciousness cannot be clouded with negative thoughts most of the time if you want to be an effective manifester. This does not mean that you do not experience any negative feelings at all. It simply means that you drop your negative feelings the moment you realize they are there, and absolutely refuse to immerse yourself in them for extended periods of time. If you'll just keep to these basic rules, then your outer manifestations have to appear for you quickly. One question I often ask is this, would you rather manifest your deepest desires or would you rather hold on to your negative feelings? For me, I would rather receive my good and everything I have asked for rather than suffer the adverse effects of holding on to those negative feelings. A person who allows himself to hold on to negative feelings is penalizing himself twice, first in terms of how miserable he feels when experiencing those feelings, and second in terms of his delayed manifestations. 
Therefore, it is never worth it to hold on to any negative feelings at all in your life. Let all of them go at once, no matter how justified you feel about the matter. A common example of how we tend to hold on to negative feelings can be found in the area of interpersonal relationships. Suppose that you had a quarrel with your partner and felt angered by something he slash she said in the heat of the moment. Most people hold on to this anger for days or weeks, refusing to speak to the other party. But why? In all of the quarrels I've had in the past, I always reconciled with the other person sooner or later. The only difference was how long it took for us to be speaking again. Therefore, if we know with the benefit of hindsight that we're going to put that unpleasant encounter behind us sooner or later and be friends again, why not do it now? Why not skip all that unnecessary part in the middle? There is nothing good to be gained from playing the silent game anyway. Why not drop those unpleasant feelings and recover from them now? Once you realize how silly it is to play the game of I don't feel like speaking to you, you start dropping your negative emotions faster than before. Holding on to them is optional. A common objection is, I want to hold on to my anger so I won't feel like speaking to him. I don't want to appear to give in by making the first move. Does this sound familiar? Again, that's such a foolish game to play. Would you rather receive your good and all your desired manifestations, or would you rather stew in your feelings of anger so as to teach the other party a lesson? You are teaching no one else a lesson but yourself. Holding on to your negative feelings does not affect the other person in any way, but it does have the tangible effect of delaying your positive manifestations in life. If the other person does not feel like patching up or speaking to you, then so be it. Make peace with the situation and be at one with it. Drop all your feelings of anger, resentment, or blame and let the other person be as he likes, while you tend to your own inner state. Once you understand this principle, you see why it never makes any sense to hold on to feelings of anger, fear, jealously, resentment, frustration or irritation about another person, no matter how justified you may be. The universe does not care about how right you are. All it cares about is the way you feel in each moment. The way you feel in each moment is creating imprints and impressions on the energetic field around you, which will subsequently attract people and events of similar nature, vibrations, into your reality. Suppose you feel jealous upon seeing the achievements of another person. The more you stew in those feelings of jealousy and think about how unfair the world is, the more you draw to yourself reasons and experiences to feel that way. Remember the attraction and confirmation role of our beliefs? Soon, you'll find your outer reality filled with many examples of injustice and things for you to be jealous about. This is universal law. It always gives you more of what you feel and focus upon. Always remind yourself that there has never been a good reason to hold on to any negative feeling. Instead, what you want to do is to drop them in the moment they arise without analyzing or engaging in them. Don't even try to analyze your feelings and figure out where they came from. I have found this form of analysis to be counterproductive. In my early days, I was always interested to find out the source of my feelings, or the reasons as to why I always felt so miserable. Remember that the mind is never able to give you an answer that is different from what it knows. All the mind can draw on is its collective storehouse of memories and beliefs. Therefore, if you ask your mind an open-ended question such as, why do I always feel so lousy, 
it can only give you an answer supported by your own memories and beliefs. If your unconscious is filled with self-defeating beliefs, then your mind would most likely respond with, oh that's because you're a loser and can never get anything right. Is this response given by your mind the absolute truth? Nope. But it is the only response it knows. It is the only response your mind can give as a result of your subconscious programming and beliefs. Therefore, trying to ask why something happened or why you are thinking in a particular way is unlikely to lead to productive outcomes. You're just falling into the trap of the ego mind and believing further in those baseless thoughts that are offered to you. You reclaim your power the moment you learn to see those thoughts for what they are, as rehashed memories, and ignore them. This is why it is important to take a light touch when solving the perceived problems and issues in your life. If you take a heavy-handed approach, you solidify and embed the issue even more firmly in your unconscious. Let us first explore how this works in relation to an addiction. When you see how this applies in one case, you'll be able to generalize the principles to other areas in your own life. It does not matter what an individual is addicted to. It can be an unhealthy substance or an unhealthy behavior such as overeating. Often, the individuals involved do not think they have an issue and do not see their behavior to be the issue. These individuals are still unconscious about the issue because they have come to associate so strongly with their behaviors and thoughts over time. A good example of this is an addiction to worrying. I was addicted to worrying for a few decades without even realizing I had this unhealthy addiction in my life. The addictive behavior felt so natural to me because I had come to perceive those worried feelings as normal. One individual I met had an addiction to spreading vile gossip and talking maliciously behind other people's backs. His own behavior seemed perfectly normal to him and he never once questioned how it affected his own reality. While there may be some addictions we are unconscious about, there are others we may be aware of. Usually, these are the addictions for which the downsides have become acutely apparent to us. I did not see my worrying as an issue previously because I did not see all the negative downsides of worrying. Similarly, the individual who spreads malicious gossip does not see the ill effects of talking bad behind other people's backs. To him, everything is just harmless gossip. But once you understand these universal principles, you realize how all of these self-defeating behaviors lead to unwanted feelings which can go on to affect your outer manifestations. The basis of any addiction is an addiction to a particular feeling. Once again, it does not matter what you are addicted to on the surface. The behavior or substance on the surface does not matter. It is the underlying feelings we are interested in here. All forms of addictive behavior result in a payoff which comes in the form of feelings. Although these feelings may often feel unpleasant to us, we still become addicted to them in a perverse way as they are familiar to us and are the feelings we have come to associate with deeply. An individual who is addicted to sexual behavior outside of marriage, or any kind of seemingly deviant behavior, may be addicted to the feelings of guilt or guilty pleasure he gets. An individual addicted to gossiping behind other people's backs is addicted to the feelings of indignation, injustice, or self-righteousness. An individual who likes to overeat may be addicted to the happy feelings he gets from consuming large amounts of food. The physical act itself is seldom where the issue lies. Rather, it is the underlying feelings that have to be addressed. The physical actions are just a bridge used to get to those feelings which we crave. In the case of substance addictions, 
the substances ingested may help to create, reinforce, or enhance those feelings. Felt Think about your own life for a moment and see if there are any addictive behaviors that have become a recurring theme for you. These can be innocuous behaviors such as constant worrying, gossiping, complaining, or jealousy over other people's achievements. What most people do is to blame themselves for their addictive behaviors without seeing the underlying truth. The underlying truth is that they are not addicted to the action or substance itself. Rather, they have become addicted to the underlying feelings derived from the addictive behavior. Each time they repeat those actions, they access that state of feelings that have become so familiar and pleasurable to them. Take some time to list down the feelings you have become addicted to in your own life. You do not have to share this list with anyone else so feel free to be honest with yourself. You do not have to describe the addictive behavior on paper either. All we are going for are the feelings behind that addiction. Sometimes, it is necessary to invent your own words and phrases to describe the underlying feelings, e.g. the I want to have it but I can't feeling, the I'm worried but I do not know what I am worried about feeling, the guilty pleasure from doing something taboo feeling. Doing this exercise is an eye-opener for many. If you take the time to try this exercise out for yourself, you'll realize that the feelings you have listed form recurring themes in your own general life experience. Suppose that guilt has been listed as one of the underlying feelings behind your addiction. What you'll likely find is the feeling of guilt resurfacing itself in several other aspects of your life, not just from the addictive behavior itself. For example, you may have a tendency to feel guilty about things, or you may frequently attract situations which make you feel guilty. In other words, we literally attract situations which give us similar feelings. Shame was one of the feelings I identified with. I was surprised to find that not only was the feeling of shame associated with my addiction, it was also a common theme in my own life back then. I frequently felt a sense of shame and inferiority when I interacted with others. Doing this exercise allowed me to bring those negative feelings to light and drop them. When I did so, the addictions resolved themselves on the outside as well. The greatest value of this exercise is that it allows us to identify the major feelings and themes that are shaping our lives. Remember the manifestation sequence we discussed earlier? 1. Unconscious memories slash beliefs equals equals 2. Conscious thoughts equals equals 3. Feelings and emotions in our inner state equals equals 4. Physical manifestations in our outer world These major themes form the third component of the chain. If left unconscious and unchecked, they will go on to attract outer circumstances and result in our physical manifestations. Addictive behaviors are caused by the link between 3 and 4 in which our addiction to particular feelings 3 causes us to engage in certain actions 4 in order to experience those feelings thus strengthening our addiction even more. The root cause of our addictions is in our unconscious memories and beliefs, 1, but dealing with addictions at this level is seldom effective because these beliefs have become so pervasive and rooted in our unconscious. Instead, a different approach is needed in the beginning. Now that you have identified the feelings which you may be addicted to, it is time to practice the same technique as before. We deal with addiction to feelings in the exact same way as we deal with negative feelings, by simply letting them go. Each time you feel an urge to engage in an addictive behavior, simply ask yourself whether you can let that feeling or urge go. Remember that the urge is nothing more than a feeling in your body which you have come to identify so closely with. 
You may see it as a compulsion or impulse to do something, but that in itself is also a feeling. It is a feeling to engage in that addictive behavior. Therefore, each time you feel like engaging in your addiction, allow yourself to stop and pause for just a moment. In the past, you would have felt the urge slash compulsion and went ahead to engage in the addictive behavior immediately. But what I suggest here is to create a small space, a little gap between having that compulsion within yourself and engaging in the behavior on the outside. During those few seconds or minutes, turn inwards and notice how you feel on the inside. Feel this urge or compulsion strongly and notice how it is just another feeling to you. You may have thought this was something beyond your physical control, but this urge is nothing more than a feeling you can drop, just like any other feeling you experience. Take a deep breath while noticing this compulsion in your body. You can do this exercise each time the urge arises, so try these steps the next time you feel the urge to engage in your addiction. Ask yourself if you can let this compulsion, compulsive feeling, go. It does not matter what your answer is, and whatever answer you give will result in you letting go of some of that feeling. This is based on the release technique I have learned from the Sedona method, for which I have found to be the most effective in letting go of unwanted feelings from our body. Remember that these feelings are not a part of our true nature. They are merely added unto, and therefore cloud, our consciousness. The next question to ask is when you can let the compulsive feeling go. You'll recognize that you can let go of the compulsive feeling right now, and that there is no need to hold on to it for any longer. As you realize that you can let go of this urge right now, breathe out slowly. It may be necessary to repeat this process several times until you release the feeling, urge, from your body. Here's how this works when applied to a real life situation, suppose you feel an urge to gossip about another person. In the past, you would just have engaged in the addictive behavior straight away. But now, with this new awareness within yourself, you allow yourself to feel this urge to gossip fully without fighting it. Notice how this urge feels like in your body. Notice how intense the feeling is. Next, ask yourself whether you can let this urge go, can I let go of this urge to gossip? Yes slash no. Take a deep breath, and then ask yourself when you can let it go, when can I let go of this urge to gossip? As you realize that the answer is right now, breathe out slowly. Repeat the above sequence a few times. Note that this is not a philosophical or reasoning exercise. We are not looking for deep answers here. Rather, the questions are a way to help you release some of those compulsive feelings from your body. Here's the important bit if you still feel like engaging in the behavior after you have let go of some of your urges, then feel free to do it. The purpose of this exercise is not to stop your addiction all at once, but rather, to make you gradually realize that you can drop the feelings surrounding your addiction and restore your inner state to one of peace and joy. Therefore, do not beat yourself up if you still feel like engaging in the behavior even after you have let some of the feelings go. Just letting go is an achievement in itself. You would have gained a level of self-awareness achieved by very few. Chapter 7, Setting the Stage for Light Touch Manifestations we have just spent the first half of this book talking about ways to return your inner state to zero. The zero state is the starting point of all manifestations. Just as an artist always creates a new piece of art with a fresh, blank canvas, we start our manifestation process from a fresh state, untainted by negative fears, worries, expectations, or past disappointments. 
Attempting to manifest in spite of these negative feelings will be like trying to create a new art piece on a used canvas. You'll be able to paint new stuff on there, but what you draw will be obscured by the ink that is already on the paper. You will never be able to have the final painting turn out as pictured in your mind's eye. You will be under the influence of everything that has already been drawn on the paper. Most manifestation studies neglect this first half of the process which is so crucially important. It is of utmost importance that you always start your manifestations from a zero state. This is a state of love, peace, and non-resistance on the inside. If you are not yet in a state of non-resistance, this means that you are not in a state that is conducive to your manifestations. Attempting any techniques from this point will only be a waste of your time and effort. Do you now see why so many people fail at using these manifestation techniques? It is not because the techniques do not work, but because most people have an incomplete understanding of the whole manifestation process. To them, the manifestation process is what they do to make things happen on the outside. It is the actual act of drawing and painting on the canvas. But they do not realize that the preparation of the canvas is equally, if not more, important. The canvas, consciousness, which you create from has to be free from the interference and encumbrances of your past thoughts, addictions, negative beliefs, other events, and worries. Getting to the state of a blank canvas takes a certain amount of time and effort which most are not prepared to spend. They just want to get to their manifestations right away. But please understand that if you took the time to practice the techniques in the previous chapters and return your inner state to zero, your manifestations would happen even without trying any of the techniques in the next half of this book. Miracles and manifestations would then happen spontaneously for you. When I talk about the importance of having a non-resistant and uncluttered inner state, I am talking about the inner state which you hold most of the time. Therefore, it is the inner state which you hold during most of your waking hours. What is your waking consciousness like? Do you feel worried or flustered most of the time? Are you negative and cynical most of the time? If so, your outer reality is likely to reflect this inner state. In my own experience, things happened very quickly for me once I managed to let go of the majority of my negative thoughts and worries. I did not drop all of them overnight or even over a few weeks, but I did let an overwhelming majority of those thoughts, around 50% of them, Go within the first few weeks I adopted this practice. My life, outer reality, started improving from that point on, once I had let go of a sufficient portion of my negative, contradictory thoughts that were holding my physical manifestations back. Do not feel discouraged if you are unable to stop worrying all at once. You are asking too much of yourself. Instead, Stop engaging in negative thoughts slash feelings one bit at a time. A little bit goes a long way. The good thing about this practice of clearing your canvas is that you can do it all the time. You spend 16 waking hours with yourself every single day, and all of those 16 hours can be used to drop negative feelings from your consciousness. Remember the manifestation sequence which we discussed earlier? We are not interested in dropping the individual thoughts from our consciousness or erasing the beliefs. That would be too much for us to deal with at once. Instead, all we are doing when we let go is to disconnect the power those thoughts have on our inner feeling state. If you'll take a few hours to do this every day, while you are engaged in other activities, you would have made considerable progress even in a single day. Note that you do not have to spend extra time on any of this. 
I have turned my daily commute of two hours into a time when I turn inwards and restore my inner state to one of love and peace. Those two hours have reaped tremendous rewards for me. I also let go of any negative feelings that arise spontaneously during the day, there and then. No one knows that I'm just quietly letting go of resistance on the inside. You may think that letting go is only a mental exercise and that nothing tangible happens on the outside. This cannot be further from the truth because as explained earlier, our feelings go on to create and affect our outer manifestations. When you do not let go of unwanted feelings on the inside and allow yourself to hold on to them intensely, these are the feelings that will go on to create unwanted, undesired manifestation in your outer world which you then have to undo physically. Therefore, it is of utmost importance to stop your unwanted future manifestations at the level of your feelings instead of at a physical level. Alright. Hopefully I have convinced you about the importance of doing the inner work. So let's assume that you have done all the inner work necessary up to this point. It is now time to practice some light touch manifestations. The questions I ask myself before I start are these, is my inner state conducive for manifestations? Is my inner state non-resistant? Is my inner state free, from negative thoughts, worries, and fears? After I ask these questions, I immediately turn my conscious attention and focus inwards. Close your eyes if necessary and feel what is happening on the inside. I also take three deep breaths, breathing out slowly each time. You don't have to strain or search too hard for your feelings. Your inner feelings will present themselves readily to you the moment you focus inwards. Notice what is there. Sometimes I notice that I have a lingering negative feeling, which feels like some sort of an uneasiness or an unsettling feeling. It is important that you do not ignore any of these feelings in your inner state. They are there for a reason, so we should address them in order to let them go. There are some manifestation teachings that ask you to conjure up and flood yourself with positive feelings that are so intense, they overwhelm any of the negative feelings you feel on the inside. But those feelings are still there. You just cannot feel them in the moment. It is of greater value to acknowledge and let those negative feelings go rather than to distract yourself with those conjured positive feelings. Suppose that you feel a sense of uneasiness on the inside. Gently place your awareness on this sense of uneasiness. You'll become more aware of this sense of uneasiness, and at the same time silently ask yourself where or what this feeling is from. Once again, do not strain to get an answer or allow your mind to throw up different logical possibilities. This is not an academic reasoning exercise here. We are not trying to throw up possible reasons as to why we are feeling this way. Rather, we are going for that sense of inner knowing. You will realize when you ask gently that you can immediately tell where that sense of uneasiness is from. It can either be due to a specific event that is occurring in your life or from a general sense of worry about something. In either case, your mind will reveal to you the information you need to know perfectly. After all, it is the mind that is causing you to feel this sense of worry. Sometimes, the mind will let you know it is worried about nothing in particular, and that it is just a general sense of worry. That's a possibility as well since our ego minds have been conditioned to keep us safe by worrying about the future. Suppose you realize that the sense of uneasiness is about your financial situation. What you can then do is to ask yourself the questions from the previous chapters and let go of the worried feelings in the moment, 1, can I let go of this uneasiness about my financial situation? 
yes slash no, two, would I let go of this uneasiness about my financial situation? Yes slash no, three, when can I let go of this uneasiness about my financial situation? Once again, these three questions are from the Sedona method and I have found them to be very helpful in guiding me to let go. I have also found that it helps to be specific about the feelings we are trying to let go of, which is why I usually add the source of those feelings as well. It may necessary to go through a few rounds of the questions to release those negative feelings and restore my inner state back to zero. I only proceed when I have let go of all my feelings of uneasiness in the moment. If there is more than one negative feeling in your inner state, you repeat the process above with each negative feeling by first asking where that negative feeling is from, and then by letting the feeling go. On certain occasions, I have found my negative feelings to be a general sense of worry about the future. In that case, I would identify it as this general worry about the future. Your question would then be, can I let go of this general worry about the future, and so on. Do not rush through this initial stage as it is important to get your inner state down to zero before proceeding. These subtle negative feelings which you detect in your inner state are commonly referred to by Abraham Hicks as resistance in our physical vibrations. Sometimes this resistance can be very subtle, in which they present themselves as slight, lingering feelings of uneasiness or discord that we barely notice. At other times, these resistant feelings are more obvious in the form of negative thoughts running through our heads. It is important to let go of any resistance once we detect them. If this resistance is allowed to linger in our consciousness, they will go on to affect our physical manifestations and may even result in various physical ailments. The most magical thing happens once you pinpoint and let go of all the lingering feelings in your inner state. When your consciousness is clear and pristine, you immediately feel an inner sense of spontaneous well-being and joy. It's the feeling that everything is well, and that everything is so wonderfully perfect in the moment. With your eyes still closed, bask in these wonderful feelings of warmth and happiness. I often feel this as an intense yet gentle feeling of joy and excitement welling up inside of me, with goosebumps breaking out all over my body. When you return your inner state to one of zero, unclouded by negative feelings, you start to perceive your world from the perspective of the universe. This is a state of pure beingness being the magnificent being that you are supposed to be without the restrictions imposed by your negative limiting beliefs. This is an unlimited state where you are not restricted by any of your negative thoughts and beliefs from the past. A natural consequence of being in this state is that it is an extremely manifestative state, one in which your intentions and desires become physically manifest very quickly. But you have to first make the effort to get there, and the universe will take care of the rest. Chapter 8 Light Touch Manifestation Points Congratulations You have reached an important milestone in this book. If you have followed along as I described the various exercises to let go and return your inner state to zero, you are in a very good position to continue that inner work as we move on to the second part of the book. None of what we cover next will work if your inner state is not mostly free from your negative feelings and thoughts. You really have to cultivate your inner state first before magic and miracles can happen on the outside. Please understand that if there are any shortcuts to manifestations, then the steps described in this book will be the closest to what you find. After trying literally thousands of techniques over the years and wondering why nothing was happening in my life, I finally realized the importance of our inner state, and the role it played at our outer manifestations. Are you ready? Let's begin.
First, we will cover the basics of light touch manifestations in which I'll illustrate the broader principles. After you have understood these broad principles, you are free to make your own rules as you go along, in line with your desires and preferences. The broader principles are here to provide some structure to our discussion so you will understand what happens along each stage. Let's get started. We have established earlier, in the first half of this book, that it is important to first get yourself into a manifestative state. This is an inner state where you feel a profound sense of peace, love, and joy. However, this sense of peace is not conjured or forced. It arises spontaneously by itself when your inner state, your inner consciousness, is free from the usual worrying and fear thoughts that plague it. The moment your mind chatter stops, a sense of profound beingness and peace starts to flood your awareness. At the same time, you will feel that everything is perfect in this world, all is well, and that nothing needs to be changed. Suddenly, all the things that seemed to bother you in the past seem so distant to you now. They just gently fade away and drop out of your awareness. You can't even recall or bring them to mind, try as you might. I have described this stage previously in some of my writings as a state in which one forgets how to worry. This is the blank canvas which we will be creating from. All of our creations and manifestations start from an intention. As I've described in my book Dollars Flow to Me Easily, the universe keeps perfect records of our intentions and desires. Thus, there is no need to repeat our intentions over and over again to the universe in the hope that we will send a clear signal. There are no signals to send, simply because the universe keeps perfect and precise records of all our intentions and desires, waiting to deliver them to us at the precise moment. When our canvas is not blank, we are creating unconsciously. What we create unconsciously is often negative, as we will create in line with the fear-slash-worrisome thoughts that appear spontaneously in our awareness. When our canvas is blank and when we are in a zero state, we are also creating unconsciously, but positively so as we are in a light state of joy and peace. Just staying in this state alone will resolve lots of problems and issues in our life. Just staying in this non-resistant state will cause lots of the things which we have previously asked for to come true for us. Our desires have already been picked up by the universe, and now is the perfect time in which the universe can finally deliver it to us. However, beginning students of this material tend to want something more. They tend to have specific intentions or desires which they want to fulfill using this method. You'll find that while this is necessary in the beginning, the need for using such pointed techniques gradually fade away after a while. When I first started applying these manifestation techniques into my own life, I found the need to use various techniques and methods to state my intentions. However, as I became more proficient at the application of this material, the need for me to state my intentions consciously gradually disappeared. The universe picked up on my intentions perfectly and delivered them to me without my active intervention. Let's suppose right now that there are a few intentions you would like to bring to fruition in your life. I would suggest that you work on only one or two major intentions at a time and not cloud your awareness with all of them. Your higher self will automatically present what is just right and important for you at this time if you let it. Therefore, while being in that quiet and peaceful state, still focused on the inside with eyes closed, ask your higher self to gently bring one of your intentions to mind. You'll find this intention floating to the forefront of your conscious awareness easily, as it is something which you would have placed much attention on in your daily life. 
If you have always had the intention of creating or attracting something new into your life, that intention will come to you fairly easily. Focus on that intention lightly in your conscious awareness. The wonderful thing about being in a light and manifestative inner state is that your consciousness is completely pristine and clear. Therefore, whatever conscious intention that you hold stands out boldly against the blank white canvas. The singular intention that you hold while in this state creates a powerful imprint on the energy field around you, which is all that is necessary. I repeat, once you let go of all the negative fear thoughts and worries in your inner state, what remains is the pristine state of beingness and nothingness. It is from this state of nothingness through which everything becomes manifest. Broadly speaking, there are two kinds of intentions which you can hold. The first are intentions to create something totally new in your life. For example, if you have never been on a trip to the Caribbean before and would like to manifest a cruise trip there. This is creating something totally new in your life which you have never experienced before. The second type of intentions are for a certain condition in your life to be different. These involve changing an existing condition or situation in your life into something more desired. Perhaps your current financial situation is undesirable and you would like to change it into something better. This belongs to the second type of intentions. Perhaps you are in a less than favorable relationship and would like to find a new life partner. Again, this involves changing a situation which you perceive as undesirable. Most people do not make this distinction when they intend something. Understanding this simple difference can make things easier. It is usually easier to manifest the first type of intentions and desires. When I say easier, I mean easier from our physical perspectives because we carry less emotional baggage and attachments about them. We have no preconceived notions and beliefs about how things should be, our past efforts, or how things should turn out. As it is something totally new in our lives, we usually approach it with a sense of eagerness. When we are dealing with the second type of intentions, we are dealing with two sides of the same coin. First, we have the undesired reality which we intend to get rid of. Next, we have the desired reality which we want to create. Very often, the opposing nature of these two sides often cancel each other out, leading to no physical results. For a start, pick an intention that belongs to the former, that of creating a totally new experience in your life. This involves manifesting something which you have not manifested before, be it an experience, relationship, tangible object, or intangible situation. In other words, the first type of intentions do not involve changing anything in your life right now in order for your desire to be manifest. These are usually easier to work with in the beginning. As mentioned, we make an imprint on the universal energy field by first becoming very still, getting our inner states down to zero and then holding an intention lightly in our minds. It is important here to take a light touch. Here's the difference between taking a light touch and using a heavy-handed approach, if you are using even the slightest force, then you are not taking a light touch. If you are trying, then you are not taking a light touch. If you are trying hard, then you are certainly not taking a light touch. When one takes a light touch, there is no effort or trying involved. You just do it very lightly. Therefore, when we hold an intention in our consciousness with a light touch, we just bring it to mind very gently and hold it there without forcing things one way or another, and without expecting things to be one way or another. How do we represent an intention in our conscious awareness? There are several different ways to do it, 
so experiment to find one that works best for you. Abraham Hicks has taught that you can choose any point slash stage in the fulfillment of your desire and then just visualize that. Let's suppose that you wish to manifest a Caribbean cruise trip. The end result, final manifestation, is seeing yourself on board the cruise ship itself. Therefore, you can hold a mental picture of yourself having a good time on the cruise. But that is not the only manifestation point which you can use. There is an infinite number of manifestation points available, one of which will feel right and appropriate for you. For example, how about walking out of the tour agency with your tickets in hand? That is another possible manifestation point which you can use. How about telling your friend that you have booked your tickets, and are setting off on a particular date? How about marking the date on your calendar and setting an auto-reply on your email? If you look closely enough, you'll find a myriad of manifestation points which you can use to represent your intention. Therefore, there is no need to always use the final end result as the starting point for the creative process. Any point in the middle will work just as well. Sometimes, choosing an end state may feel too distant for us. I have found that very often, I do not know the exact details of how things will look like when the physical manifestation happens, so I may actually add a sense of confusion into the vibrational mix if I attempt to imagine how things will look like when they are finally manifested. Remember that any time you feel that you're trying, hard, for example trying hard to come up with the details, you're not taking a light touch. That is when you should choose an alternative manifestation point that feels right for you. Once you have selected an appropriate, or a few, manifestation points, feel the feelings of completion and assurance that you will feel at each of these manifestation points. Again, if you need to try hard to conjure up those feelings, then you are not taking a light touch. So what you can do is to select another manifestation point, probably closer to the present moment, that feels more realistic to you. Can you see what we are doing here? Instead of always stubbornly visualizing the end result of our manifestations, we can just as easily pick an intermediate point that lies in between our now moment and the manifestation point. Any one of these points will work as long as you can associate with them. We've all had the experience of booking tickets with the tour agent and being in their office, so why not use that as your manifestation point instead of the Caribbean cruise experience which may be totally new to you. Choose any manifestation point that suits you best. Once you have identified a manifestation point, feel the feelings associated with that point. How will you feel when you reach that point? How will you feel when you are there? The feeling state is what we are going for here. This feeling state gives you inner confirmation that the physical manifestation is inevitable and on its way. Pick an appropriate manifestation point that evokes these feelings for you. What you do to make an imprint on the energy field is to gently bring this intention to mind, and then feel the feelings associated with that manifestation point. At the same time, it helps if you hold a mental picture, or play a mental movie, related to that manifestation point. Once again, if you feel a need to try hard to picture any of these, you're trying too hard. Let go and take a lighter touch. There should be no effort needed in any of this. The images and feelings should come spontaneously to you. After you have immersed yourself in the feelings associated with your manifestation point, drop the intention from your mind. The few seconds or minutes of pure, 
focused mental activity would have set off powerful universal forces that can now go on to fulfill your desire without your intervention. There is nothing more you have to do except to drop the intention completely from your mind and go back to a state of zero. If you find yourself clinging on to your earlier intention or worried about whether you have held that intention long enough, then you're trying too hard and probably still attached to the outcome. Let all of that go. Here are a summary of the steps to shape the energy field around you. 1. Pick an intention that involves creating something totally new for you, one that does not involve changing slash replacing something in your existing reality. 2. See if you can sum the intention up in one feeling. To do so, you may first need to identify a suitable manifestation point. There is an infinite number of manifestation points you can use. A manifestation point is any step along the sequence of events leading up to the final manifestation. 3. If you feel yourself straining hard to fill in the details associated with that manifestation point, then you may have selected a point that is too far out into the process, such that feelings of confusion and uncertainty are starting to set in. If that's the case, just pick a manifestation point that is closer to your current reality. 4. Once a manifestation point is selected, feel the feelings associated with that point. 5. Hold the feelings and immerse yourself in them until you feel you are ready to let it go. This it is done, feeling will come up spontaneously for you. 6. Let the intention slash associated feelings go from your conscious awareness and return your inner state again to one of peace and beingness. It is done. I think of the series of steps above as a light touch manifestation sequence. First, you enter a state of profound peace and stillness. Second, you hold your intention lightly. Third, you return yourself back to that initial state of peace and stillness again. What this does is to imprint your intentions clearly without any unintended feelings or emotions. If you were to go directly from one intention to the next, or from your intention back to your waking consciousness, there may be residual feelings and emotions that are carried over to your intention or even back to your waking state. Remember that it is just as important to return to a state of peace, as it is to begin from a state of peace when doing this inner work. Chapter 9, Manifestations Involving Change, Manifestations that involve changing circumstances or situations in our lives are tricky, largely because most people do not realize the deep emotional baggage they have attached to these intentions. While your intention may seem straightforward on the surface, for example, your intention to drive a new car, this intention is actually tied to a few related intentions. In order to drive a new car, you'll first have to sell the old car which you are currently driving. Your old car may have given you considerable headache in terms of upkeep and maintenance. Therefore, without even realizing it, you would have attached all of this emotional baggage to the manifestation of the new car as well. Next, there is the issue of how to get rid of the old car. You may feel that you are stuck with the old car because of your finances, in which case the thought of manifesting a new car is clouded with worries about how you will find the money required. As you can see, there may be considerable worry and negative feelings unknowingly attached to the current circumstances. These worries keep the current situation deeply ingrained in your reality. It is helpful to think of manifestations involving change as consisting of two parts. The first part is your current unwanted reality which you are trying to drop. The second is your desired reality which you are trying to create. Note that each is a separate intention that both often cancel each other out and work in opposite directions. 
This is the exact reason why some people have so much trouble manifesting their desires. They are unknowingly setting positive intentions and then cancelling them out later through their focus on the negative aspects. Let's suppose that you are having issues at the workplace with your co-workers. This is the undesired reality which you are trying to get rid of. The desired reality is a harmonious workplace where everyone gets along well with everyone else. By lumping these two intentions into one, we often cancel any physical manifestations out, which leads to no change in our outer circumstances. This is because each time we think of our second intention, for a more harmonious workplace, we automatically call to mind the first intention, that there are interpersonal issues at our workplace. Although we are trying to move away from the undesired situation to a more desired one, the universe doesn't work this way. Our universe works on the basis of attraction and not exclusion. This means that we can never think about something and then say no to it. The very fact that we are thinking about something unwanted means that we are attracting it to our reality, because of the energy slash focus slash awareness we are feeding into the situation. If you understand this paradox, you'll immediately understand why some of your manifestations have been so long in coming for you. For example, if you say, I want more money, a positive intention, but at the same time say because I do not have enough money, a negative intention, then these two intentions are going to cancel each other out. Regression to the same spot is often a sign that we are engaged in this form of thinking and operating in the world. Note that it does not matter whether you are saying yes or no at the level of your physical words. What matters is how you feel as you say yes or no. That is what is going to be delivered to you. What I have found useful when handling perceived problems and issues in our life is to first drop the perceived issues completely from our consciousness. Therefore, do not try to manifest the desired end result at once. Recognize the situation for what it is and do it one step at a time. We do so by first identifying the undesirable circumstances which we are trying to drop from our lives. I use the word drop because that is exactly what we have to do, to let it go completely from our lives, to stop talking about it and to stop paying any attention to it. In other words, we must first withdraw our conscious attention from the perceived problem completely. Please note that your manifestation success will be in direct proportion to how well you can withdraw your conscious focus from the perceived issue at hand, no matter how serious it seems. Let me repeat this key point again, your success will be in direct proportion to how well you can withdraw your conscious focus from the perceived issue at hand, no matter how serious or undesirable it seems. You must be willing to give up the need to talk about the current circumstances as they are, and instead focus entirely on how you want things to be. I have realized that most people can't do these two steps at once, which is why it is helpful to break them down into two separate steps. First, drop the issue completely from your consciousness and return to the void. Second, focus purely on the new, desired reality which you would like to create in its place until it is manifested. Let's first take a look at how to drop an issue from our consciousness. Chapter 10, Light Touch Dropping Sequence, Dropping an issue from your consciousness is easier done with the heart than with the mind. I have already explained that our universe works on the basis of attraction and not exclusion. We cannot drop something from our consciousness by affirming that it does not exist, or by thinking that it is not there. The very mere act of affirming or thinking about it, the issue, perpetuates its continued existence in our lives. Therefore, a more effective way is needed to drop an issue from our consciousness, 
and hence reality, entirely. This is something counterintuitive and not easily grasped by our intellect, since we have been so used to saying no to things in order to push them away from us. But understand that while saying no may work at a physical level, saying no to something, especially with great intensity, does not work at a spiritual level. One can never say no to sickness and keep it away, but we can say yes to wellness and health. One can never say no to lack and hope to push it away, but we can say yes to prosperity and abundance. Understanding this principle will clear things up very quickly in your life because the moment you drop something from your consciousness, you instantly erase it from your physical reality with an astonishing speed that will surprise even you. Long-standing problems, issues, addictions, and dramas in your life just fall away on their own. We do so through the use of dropping sequences. I first became interested in these sequences ever since I learned about them from several healing modalities. I noticed that several healing traditions deal with the erasing or deletion of problems and issues, and this made me curious. For example, the Hawaiian Hupanapano spiritual healing tradition, popularized by Dr. Ihili Hulen and his co-author Joe Vital from The Secret, revolves around the use of strange, or even seemingly absurd clearing-slash-cleaning processes. One such clearing process is to repeat the phrases thank you, I love you, I am sorry and please forgive me over and over again. These phrases are not repeated or said out loud to anyone in particular. Instead, they are repeated silently over and over again to oneself to erase the source of the problem in our subconscious. Another cleaning procedure, which many find absurd, is to simply use the eraser end of an unsharpened pencil to tap on whatever we are trying to clean while mentally repeating the word dewdrop. This will clean everything that is associated with the object and issue. Other healing modalities such as matrix energetics and the Yun method work along the same lines. The first issue that most people come up against when they learn about these healing modalities is the counterintuitive manner in which they work. The results simply cannot be explained by logic, or can they? To the uninitiated, the results are magical. How can long-standing problems and issues be resolved overnight, or how can physical manifestations come into our lives in an instant? But to someone who understands the spiritual principles and laws behind these phenomena, you will understand that they all happen in accordance with universal laws. How can things be any other way? When you understand the true nature of your own being and of this universe, miracles are abound in your own physical life experience and you no longer feel surprised by them. The focus of the healing modalities above have been more on the healing of physical ailments and diseases. However, I have been more interested in the use of these techniques for physical manifestations. But understand that there is really no difference between a healing and a physical manifestation. A healing is a manifestation. It is a physical manifestation of wellness and health. Therefore, everything in our life is a process of manifestation and creation. We are always manifesting whether we know it or not. The simplest way to explain how this works is through the common admonishment, don't think of a pink elephant. In the moment you heard that statement, what did you unconsciously think of? That's right, a pink elephant. Your attention was immediately drawn to that imaginary pink elephant, even though you may not have seen a pink elephant in your mind's eye. This is the same issue we are facing here. We are trying to drop something unwanted from our lives without thinking about it. But how are we supposed to drop something without thinking about it in the first place? How do we drop lack and limitation from our life, 
without first thinking about that lack, and then proceeding to drop it? Or is there a way to drop it straight away without having to think about it? This is more than just a mental exercise. As mentioned earlier, if you successfully master this new way of living, you would have found a way to sidestep most of the perceived problems and issues in your life. They would just fall away by their own accord. Let me explain how. This is the dropping sequence I have designed for use with light touch manifestations. The first step is to trust that your higher self already knows what you want to drop from your current reality. Through your past experiences and preferences, you already have a clear idea of what is unwanted in your experience. Therefore, there is no need to keep reminding yourself of the unwanted slash undesirable parts of your life. The second step is to get to that conducive and manifestative inner state where you feel a sense of lightness and peace. Once you are there, it is time to start the dropping process. The prerequisite of using a dropping sequence is that you have to be in a conducive inner state, free from the influence of any negative thoughts or worries. You do not have to consciously believe that this works, but you must be in a state of non-resistant peace and joy first such that you are not pushing against yourself. Only in this state can you take a light touch and make an impression in the energy field around you. Once you are in this state, you need to start a sequence that automatically drops the unwanted issue from your consciousness entirely. Note that this sequence cannot remind you of or be related to the issue itself. This is why several healing modalities have come up with seemingly illogical methods which involve totally unrelated and strange imageries. There is a method to their madness. It is to start the dropping process purely without calling up the problem or issue itself. You start the dropping process by gently bringing to mind a word which you have come to associate with dropping or letting go. For me, I like to use the word drop as it represents a sense of ease and effortlessness. There is no effort needed to drop anything. We just simply let go and it falls away. You can just as easily use any word that evokes the same feelings for you, so long as they do not remind you of the problem slash issue itself. Pick a word that is totally unrelated to the perceived problem slash issues in your life. Once I am in my peaceful inner state, I gently bring the word drop to my consciousness. This is all you have to do. What you have just done is to start the dropping sequence of dropping everything that is unwanted slash undesired by you at this time. You do not even have to physically direct the process or think about what has to be dropped. Do not bring up anything about the perceived issue slash problem which you are trying to solve. Do not think about any of it, or imagine the issue fully resolved in your mind's eye. That will not be necessary. Instead, just mentally think to yourself drop, and that's it. Note that there is no need to feel the issue dropping or resolving itself, because that would bring up the vibrations of that issue in your own inner state. This is the key. Drop, drop, drop. Just the word drop is necessary to start the dropping process. You can also use the phrase I drop what needs to be dropped to start the process, and it is done. Take note of how you feel on the inside when you use the dropping process. You should feel a sense of peace and lightness, just like how you felt when you first started. Therefore, introducing the word drop into your conscious awareness should do absolutely nothing to you. If you suddenly feel a sense of fear or worry, or if your mind suddenly drifts to thinking about the problem itself and consciously trying to drop it, then you're trying too hard. You are no longer taking a light touch. 
you are allowing your conscious attention and conscious thoughts to flow back to the very issue which you are trying to drop. This is not the direction we are trying to move towards. You should think drop purely and then let it go at that. You should feel nothing different as you think it. Feeling a constant sense of peace and love in your inner state while you silently think drop, is an indication that things are happening in your inner state. We are going to the stuck energetic patterns that have kept things in their places and resetting them. Therefore, the words zero, reset and erase will work just as well. Experiment to see which word you like best. Unlike most of the processes I have offered in my books, this dropping sequence is not a feeling process. There are no good feelings you have to feel, although I have felt a spontaneous deepening of my sense of lightness and peace when I use the dropping process. Feeling more peace is positive proof that the dropping sequence is working, and that you are freeing up more of your consciousness. Resist the urge to check your physical reality for signs of change after you have emerged from your peaceful state. The very urge to check whether something has worked puts your focus right back on the issue. What you should do instead is to silently think of the word drop several times throughout the day when you are going about your daily activities without reference to anything in particular. Your use of the word drop has to stand purely by itself. You cannot be thinking of the word drop as part of the phrase dropping my lack, or dropping my problems. The thought of the word has to be purely by itself, drop. That is the only thing you have to do. The universe takes care of the rest. The very next thing you know, you realize that the issues which have bothered you for the longest time have disappeared. They are no longer in your life. The things that have tormented you and caused you sleepless nights have straightened themselves out automatically without your active intervention. But resist the urge to look for signs of change. Let those signs present themselves to you. There is no need for you to look out for them. Just drop, drop, and drop. Why does this work? It is certainly not a magical process, although the results can sometimes appear to be. When you mentally think drop to yourself, you let go of your continued focus on the unwanted and undesired. Instead of fighting so hard against the perceived challenges in your life, you take a light touch. By loosening your grip on all these perceived problems, you are letting them fall away on their own. You no longer insist that they are there. Instead, you free up the energy to return to the void and let it become something else. This is the power of the dropping sequence. Chapter 11, The Power of Focusing on the White Space, There is Tremendous Power in Dropping the Unwanted in Each Moment. Unwanted thoughts, feelings, and beliefs eventually lead to unwanted physical manifestations. You can invoke the dropping sequence everywhere and anywhere you are. While driving along the freeway or on your daily commute to work, simply repeat the word drop gently and let the universe do the rest. Your higher self knows exactly what is no longer the best for you and what needs to be dropped in each moment. When you think of the word drop, you give yourself permission to transmute all your negative beliefs, thoughts and memories that no longer serve you back to nothingness. As a result, you no longer perpetuate undesired reality the way it is. What can you expect from a continued use of the dropping sequence? The greatest value of the dropping process is that you are taking an extremely light touch and not actively fighting the issue at hand. Think about dropping an issue as focusing on the white spaces on a piece of paper. The issues are the words that are printed on the paper with black ink. When we want to drop the perceived problems or issues from our lives, 
we do not focus on the words printed on the paper, as many people do, but should instead focus on the white spaces and seeing this white space as engulfing everything. When you think drop, you focus on the white spaces instead of the unwanted words on the paper. You are making an imprint on the energetic field around you yet at the same time not consciously doing anything. So in a sense, the dropping process is the perfect example of letting go and letting God. You are stepping out of your own way and letting the magic happen without resisting it. If you'll keep at the dropping process for a few weeks, you'll feel lighter and freer. But most importantly, you'll find that your perceived problems and issues in life no longer bother you as much. All the things that bothered or troubled you in the past seem to straighten themselves out or fade away into the background. That's because you have taken a light touch and gently dropped them from your consciousness. There is no need to worry about what you are dropping when you use the dropping process. There is also no need to worry about whether anything is happening. If you, keep worrying about whether you are indeed dropping what needs to be dropped, then you do not reap the full benefits of this technique. The whole purpose of this technique is for us to turn away and completely loosen our grip on the perceived issues in our lives. Therefore, you don't have to consciously think about a problem or bring a problem to mind in order for it to be dropped. Your past intentions for positive changes have already set things into motion, and you are now allowing these changes to happen when you think drop. That's the beauty of the dropping process. All you need to do is to say or think drop, and let go of the issue one bit at a time. I love this technique and do it all the time. After you have kept at the dropping process for some time, you'll feel a sense of inexplicable lightness and joy, as if what has bothered you in the past has just faded away. It is as if the cause of what has been bothering you for a long time has been taken away, and you will know it deeply in your beingness. You'll know and feel it so strongly that there is no need to look to the outside for physical evidence or proof. You just know that it is so, and that it is done. This is when you are ready for the next step of the process, which is to follow the steps in Chapter 8 to lightly intend a new reality for yourself. However, I can assure you that profound changes will still occur even if you do not follow the active manifestation steps in Chapter 8, if you are diligent in your application of the dropping sequence. Just dropping unwanted negative thoughts and issues from your life will automatically allow for positive changes to enter your life with very little effort. Let us take a look at the manifestation sequence and see how everything fits together. Recall that, 1, unconscious memories slash beliefs equals equals, 2, conscious thoughts equals equals, 3, feelings and emotions in our inner state equals equals, 4, physical manifestations in our outer world, what does the dropping sequence drop or clean up in our lives? When we start the dropping sequence, we are actually cleaning up unwanted memories, thoughts and beliefs in our unconscious. That is the very first component of the manifestation chain. Therefore, we are going to the root of the issue and returning the root cause of any perceived problem in our lives, the unwanted manifestations, back to zero. Once you have dealt with the root cause, they can no longer lead to, two, conscious thoughts and subsequently, three, feelings and emotions which lead to, four, outer physical manifestations. That's why the dropping process is so powerful. It dissolves the root cause of anything unwanted. The only downside of this process is that most people do not use these techniques consistently because their logical left brain cannot grasp or understand the concepts logically. To them, 
they can't understand how we can possibly let go of something without first calling it to mind or paying attention to it. That would be falling into the same trap as before. The moment we bring a problem to mind, we hold conscious thoughts, too, about the very issue we are trying to push away. However, since the universe does not work on the basis of exclusion, these, too, conscious thoughts will lead to, 3, feelings and emotions which eventually lead to, 4, outer manifestations. Therefore, while it seems as if we are saying no to something and actively trying to come up with ways to work around the issue, our attention to it is what causes the very issue to be perpetuated in our reality. This is why millions of people around the world stay trapped in these negative manifestation cycles. In the early days of my spiritual journey, I had an extremely difficult time trying to manifest more money in my life. I tried every single trick in the book and applied every technique I learned, but still nothing happened. It did not dawn on me that the problem was due to my continued fixation on the financial lack in my life. I thought I was trying to push away the lack by saying no to it and thinking of ways to overcome it, when in fact my conscious attention to it was perpetuating the lack. If I had applied this dropping sequence back then and withdrawn my consciousness entirely from the perceived lack, the situation would have straightened itself out in a few days or weeks at most. I know this to be true, for this was what happened when I finally understood the true essence of these manifestation principles. My outer reality turned around and everything I asked for so badly all my life came to me in a matter of weeks. It can be the same for you too so long as you give this new way of thinking and acting in the world a try. Always take a light touch. Now that we know how to handle, 1, the unconscious memories and beliefs in our lives, let's summarize how we can work with the other parts of the manifestation sequence to achieve our desired outer manifestations. Recall that it is impossible to control our, 2, conscious thoughts, since so many of them race through our minds every moment. Therefore, the trick here is not to control and monitor every single thought of ours, but to simply disconnect the chain between, 2, our conscious thoughts and, 3, our feelings and emotions as a result of these thoughts. You do so by using the letting go process taught in Chapter 5. Once you have mastered the letting go process, these thoughts would no longer have any power or emotional charge over you. You would have stopped your unwanted manifestations in their tracks, like disconnecting the wires from the terminals of a battery. The battery may still be there with its massive capacity, but the electrical current is no longer flowing and can no longer inflict damage because you have disconnected the wires. This is a wonderful shortcut to freeing yourself from the influence of all your negative thoughts. The end result of all this is that you return your inner state back to one of beingness, as it has always meant to be. This is your natural state. Your inner state is no longer clouded with frivolous worries and thoughts that occupy your attention all day long which caused your negative feelings to go into overdrive. Instead, you are now free to perceive and create from the universe's perspective. It is a wonderfully liberating state to be in when you finally realize that you are free, and have always been. Free from your negative problems and worries, but most importantly, free to create reality in whatever way you desire. If you apply the techniques taught in this book consistently for the next few weeks, you'll gradually come to realize the true cause of both the wanted and unwanted manifestations in your life. You'll no longer be a victim of circumstances or blind luck. Instead, you'll know what exactly is causing reality to be the way it is on the outside and how to correct it on the inside. With this new understanding, 
No situation in life can phase you for you can always pinpoint their exact cause and work to drop anything unwanted from your life experience at once. It is my intention that you'll be able to reach this easy, effortless state in just a few weeks of intentionally applying this material. There is truly no limit to how good life gets and I invite you to experience the power of light touch manifestations starting today. Drop and it is done.